when you get there, there'll be a table, and the check-in person will be right there. Then the kiddos are going to go upstairs uh, into the youth area for their music time, and then they'll go back downstairs then for their teaching time. So everything goes left today and, uh, and, and continues on. Uh, we, we're giving more room over here for the gathering church uh, to have that area there. So thank you for that. So say good riddance, kids. I mean, goodbye, kids. Just kids. My kiddos. So we're in the last, the last uh, se- of sermon of our series, The God Question. And I will tell you that uh, quickly on Sunday nights, uh, we won't have church tonight, but next week will be the last of our uh, winter semester for our connect groups. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, last week, but we had the one snow night, so we're moving that one week farther. And for our spring semester, it'll go six weeks as well. Uh, the three weeks that precede Easter, uh, Andy Brown will be here, and he's going to do a, um, a series, a teaching series over there, um, loosely called Preparation for a New Service, right? And so he's going to be there three weeks, take 30 minutes of the time, he'll teach the lesson, then we're going to break into our, into our connect groups, and we'll do discussion questions and talking, and you'll be facilitated through that. And uh, so that'll be from um, Sunday the 31st. Uh, for three weeks there, and so that'll be a great deal there. And then the Sunday after uh, Easter, uh, uh, we'll be starting a new series there that I'll be teaching called uh, the God Question Teaching Series for three more weeks after that. So put those on your calendars. We'll be talking about that more as we go along. This morning, in our last God Question, I had a two or three different ways that I thought about going, but uh, based on some conversations that I've had with several of you in the last couple of weeks, three weeks maybe, uh, concerning this one particular issue or question, I thought I'd preach on it this morning. And basically, the, the title or subtitle for our sermon this morning is How Can I Live Out God's Call on My Life? You know, you always talk about, well, I, I don't know what God's calling is, but there are a lot of you people that have gotten God's call, but you don't know how to get into it. You don't know how to finish it. You don't know how to complete it. You don't know how to live out that calling that God's given you. So this morning, I'm going to try my best to answer that God question, how can I live out God's call on my life? How can I live out God's call on my life? Um, turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 26, and we'll start reading it. We'll just have two verses there, verses 24 and 25. We'll get to that text in a few minutes, but I'm going to give you a little background, uh, a little history on our main character, the one that's going to teach us or show us uh, some, some ways to get to where we're trying to go. Um, let me give you a little background. I, I need to set this up so we'll understand the context that we're, that we're about to learn. So I'm going to teach for a bit, and then I'm going to preach for a bit if that's okay. So bear with me, stick with me to learn about this character. Then we'll get into the principle of this passage, okay? So our, our passage this morning tells us there's a man named Isaac. He was the son of a famous father, Abraham, and the father of a famous son, Jacob, who would later be called Israel, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Isaac was the child, if you'll remember, that Abraham had been waiting a hundred years for, the child of God's promise. He was the miracle baby conceived after Sarah had given up on any idea that it was even possible, right? Isaac was the one who would carry on the bloodline of the promise that God gave Abraham, right? That God would make Abraham's seed as like grains of sand in the ocean. And on the other end, you'll remember that it was also Isaac that was on his deathbed who laid his hands of, hand of blessing upon Jacob instead of the older one, Esau, because um, Jacob deceived him. And it was through that deception that Israel was forever uh, changed. I mean, even down to this present day, the Jews speak of the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. So that in a nutshell is the history of Isaac and the man that we're going to follow this morning. So in this passage, we're going to see three things that Isaac did to successfully follow the call that God had given him in his life. So let's read this passage out of Genesis chapter 26, verses 24 and 25. That night, it says, the Lord appeared to him, talking about Isaac, and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Now watch this. Here's the three things that Isaac did after getting this word from God. It says, verse 25, Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. 
There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we just give, give you praise for this morning, Lord. Thank you for all the things that you're doing in our church, Lord. I just want to lift up your name for all that we're going to learn this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you will prick our hearts this morning, Lord, in the knowledge of what we need to know to follow your call. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So, now, now that we know who Isaac is, let's take a moment and see if we can learn about what Isaac does to carry out God's plan for his life. So, at this particular time in history, the area that Isaac lived in was involved in a terrible famine, and God had led Isaac to live in the land of the Philistines. Kind of counterintuitive when you think that the Philistines were always at war with Jewish people. It was not a love relationship. It was a love-hate relationship but this is where that I that God called Isaac to be I wonder if sometimes God doesn't take us into an area that we don't like or we're uncomfortable in or even we're afraid of so that he can do things in our life and so that may have been the case here because when he went into Philistines if you'll look um, at, at, at the Philistines and the Jewish people they really didn't get along but but in spite of all of that God still blessed Isaac, and, uh, and I think it was largely because he was a very faithful man. But even with that, maybe this was a time in Isaac's life where he maybe knew what God wanted him to do, but hadn't done it to the fullness that he would think God would want him to. So if you remember, you know, Isaac uh, was so afraid of the Philistines <laughs> that he actually lied and said that Rebecca was his sister instead of his wife because he was afraid that if they uh, knew that Rebecca was his wife, they would kill him and take his wife. I, I have the same fear, Carol and I. Uh, a lot of times I call her my sister because I'm afraid somebody will kill me and take her, right? So anyway, that hadn't happened yet, but it's coming. So when Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, found out that, that, that Isaac had done this, he said, man, you can't do that to us. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have sinned before God and all of those different things. And so he sent out a decree that nobody was to hurt um, Rebecca or nobody was to hurt Isaac. So you see, the thing where we mess up, you know, God came in and cleaned it up and made it better. And all the things that, 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 that Isaac was afraid of, that was scared of, that he wasn't wanting to do because he didn't have the ability to do, God did it anyway through him. And so he took a man that was in a place he was afraid of that didn't want to be, and he made it into a place where he could have ministry. That, well, that's for another day. Uh, we also see that God continued to be faithful, and he greatly blessed Isaac while he was living in the land of the Philistines. If you go back to verses 12 and 13, it says, Isaac planted crops in that land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. You see that up there? Can you say that with me? I'll make sure you're with me this one. Because the Lord pleased him. The Lord blessed him. <laughs> Y'all got it right, I got it wrong. Because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. It was clear that Isaac had, had reason to trust in God. But like us, we'll go through a period of, of great blessing, but then life happens. And a storm will come into your life. And a storm came into Isaac's life. Uh, the Philistines got jealous of Isaac, and they came along, and they, they filled in all his wells. Well, you know, without water, you can't live, and this is a barren area, and so every well that he had dug, they came in, filled them in. Their king, Abimelech, came to Isaac and said, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. Let me just tell you this. When you've got God in your life, you're way too powerful for everybody else. We just don't know it. If God's called you for something. He will equip you for it, and whoever said boom over there, I like it. I like it. So Isaac had no other choice but to begin moving around from place to place. Everywhere he went, he encountered opposition and conflict until finally he came to this city called Beersheba. Now, I don't know about you, but, but there have certainly been times in my life where I didn't have a clue what God's will was for my life, but there's also been times where I knew what God's will was for my life, but I was afraid to follow it through. I, I'll tell you a quick story that I probably some of you have already heard, many maybe. But when, uh, when uh, I was at First Baptist of Lowell, a pretty good-sized church, had a big, nice office, big, nice building, got everything set, just like I had all my ducks in a row. And then this little church over here that run about 30 called me to be their pastor. 
and we were in a dilapidated building. We were in a place where there wasn't that many people, and, and, and we just and we sat down, and, and I, I handed them a sheet of paper that had my salary requirements is what I was making then, and I didn't have any way to make more and all this. I was scared to death, but I finally looked at that committee, and I said, look, if you're willing, I'm willing. Scared to death of what would happen if God didn't take care of me. I could have stayed over there and made money for a long time until they ran me off, which was quite possible. But God had a plan for my life and for yours. And he, for some reason, saw that this guy needed to be the pastor here, and he called me over here. He called me to come to this place. It was at that point that I had the option to say, yes, God, or no, God, right? Because we have that ability. We have that ability when we're lost to say yes, God, or no, God. We have that ability when we get saved and God calls, put a call on our life to say yes, God, or no, God. We have that ability to make a choice every time that, that, that a temptation comes into our life. We have the ability to say yes, God, or no, God. I'll tell you a story this week. <laughs> this week, a young man, or a couple of weeks, a young man came to me and said, uh, I've, got, uh, uh, I, I've, I've got something I need to do. And I said, okay, what's that? He said, well, you know that, that, that car that, that, that um, we, we gave to this young lady and the transmission went out on it and all that? And I said, yeah, I remember that. I said, you bought that car, right? You gave like $300 for it. And he said, yeah. He said, I want to give that car back to her. I said, well, you want to sell that back to her for $300? He said, no, I want to give it to her. I said, well, you've already given her $300. Now you're going to give her the car back? And he said, yeah. I said, well, listen. I said, that's a great thing to do. Let me pay you the $300 so that at least you'll break even. He said, no, that's not what God called me to do. God called me to give the car to her. So he had a choice to either follow God or not to follow God. You know what I'm saying? And that's the thing here that we see in this particular passage of Scripture here. Isaac had a choice about what to do or what to not do. But in, but in this particular case, he said, God, I'll, I'll do whatever is necessary. And then in, in verse 24, chapter 26 of Genesis, God comes to him and says, I am the God of your father Abraham. Isaac had seen what God had done in Abraham's life. Isaac was there when they went up on top of the mountain. Isaac was there whenever he was strapped down to that altar and the knife went up. Isaac was there when all that happened. And he was also there when they walked up the hill. And Isaac said to his father, we have the fire and we have the wood, but we don't have a sacrifice. <laughs> and, Isaac, and, and Isaac heard his father say, the Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. So he had a choice to make. But he also, he also had a history of knowing what God was like. And so when God came to him, verse 24, it says, I'm the God of your father Abraham. Don't be afraid, for I'm with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Now watch this. What follows next is the roadmap that we're talking about for success when you're talking about following the call of God. So many times... We have a moment with God. We come into this place. We get a word from God. And then we leave this building the same way we came in. And we, 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 we know what God wants us to do, but we're just not willing to do it. We think we're not able to do it. But in fact, it's not that we're not able to do it because God can equip us to do anything he calls us for. You know what I'm saying? You with me, folks? You with me? So, I mean, I could go a whole bunch of different ways on this, but i just tell you this. When we started talking about the idea of making a new service over here called, called The Gathering, we didn't have a name for it. Um, God, I think, gave me this vision. And I, 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 I started casting this vision that I'm, I'm certain came from God. But then we started talking about the actual logistics of what it's going to take to make it happen. So <laughs> there's a lot, right? I mean, we got, we, we, you know, God kind of visioned me to say, it's about $15,000. That's what I'm wanting you to do this for. <laughs> well, I gave 12,500 to one group. I gave 2,500 to the other group. The other group came to me and said, that's not enough. I said, yes, it is enough if God's in it, right? And we, we tussled through that a little bit. And you know what we're spending? Not 4,500 like they thought, 2,500 like God thought. I'm just going to tell you that when God calls you and God equips you, God gives you the ability to do what he's called you to do in the first place. Anybody agree? Anybody agree? Because that's how good God is. Right? So we got all this stuff in place and all of it's working and we're just headed that way. And, and you, know, I, you know, Tyler kind of made a slip of the tongue this morning by saying the pastor had a call and we made it better. No, pastor had a call from God and may, they made it happen. That's what they're doing. They're making it happen. They didn't make it better because nothing's better than God. 
But I'm going to tell you what, this little committee got out there and they, they worked their hinds ends off and it's going to be great because we didn't necessarily know what we're doing, but we knew who to call on to make it happen. Because when God gives you a call, God equips you to make that call happen and it won't be because you're so smart, it'll be because he's so smart. Does anybody agree? So, so let me get back to our text here for just a second. And uh, verse 24, that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm the Lord your God. Uh, of, of your Lord, I am the God of your father Abraham. Don't be afraid, for I'm with you. I'll bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for my sake, Abraham. Now, <clears throat> what did God call Abraham to do? He called him to leave his home and to lead the Jewish people. He was going to be the father of this great nation, and he would lead him to the promised land. Now, Abraham is not in the picture any longer, and he has called Isaac to follow on. If you'll read through that first uh, several chapters before this in Genesis, you'll see what that call on Abraham is, and now God's asking Isaac uh, to do that same thing. Now, it's not quite as clear right in here in this verse, but if you'll, read the, uh, if you'll read the context of the verses around that, you'll see that. So three things, three things that Isaac did when he received this clear calling from God. First, if you'll see it in verse 25, first, he built an altar. First, he built an altar. Um, tell you a quick story. If you go into the prayer garden over here where the little fish pond is, if you go over to the, to the left side of that area or the side toward the education building, you're going to see some big stones. They're this big to this big. And if you'll count them, there's 12 of them. And, it, and how many of you here for the stewardship banquet that we did at the little school back here when I had my deacons bring in those 12 stones? <laughs> because God, listen, because God gave us a call. God gave us a, my, a mighty call. We, we were, we're, not, we're not a church that, we were certainly not a church that could afford a million dollars, but we had a call from God, and God gave us the ability to do it. And every time that, that, that God gives you a call, you'll see there that they built an altar. They, he built an altar. In fact, verse 25 says, Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Listen, Isaac drove a stake in the ground, and he says, you've given me a calling, and my, night, and my life will never be the same again. And he began to fervently ask God to show him the right path and to give him the right knowledge, information, and ability to get to the place where God wanted him to go. I mean, remember, Isaac knew all about altars, right? I mean, you're, his father, Abraham, had taught him all about that, and we talked about it earlier when he took him up on Mount Moriah for all that. It shows uh, the altar shows dedication. It shows dedication. And so why did God call Abraham to take his son, his only son, who he, lo who he loved, and take him on top of Mount Moriah and bind him, lay him on an altar, and pull a knife up in the air ready to kill him? Why did God do all that? He wanted to know <laughs> if Abraham was dedicated to the call. Man, that's a big thing, y'all. And I don't know, maybe God calls us times, at times, and says, are you really dedicated to the call? Or are you only just kind of built up in the emotion? And I love the story, and I'm sure you do too. It's a great story for us because we know the end. But what do you think Abraham was thinking when he took the knife and he raised it up in the air, and his son's slain right. Think about your kids. Would you do that? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. But Abraham was diligent, and he was dedicated, and he wanted to show God that he was willing to do whatever it took. In fact, it says, I think in the book of Hebrews, it says that he knew that God was so faithful that even if he killed his son, that God would bring him back to life. That's a lot of faith, amen? Um. An altar speaks of dedication. Possibly no one knew the full cost of dedication better than, than Isaac did. So there, there's something else special about an altar. An, an altar is where you make sacrifices to God, right? An altar is where you worship God. An altar is where you seek answers from God. When, when, uh, when we were building this room, uh, my, my, I, I really didn't care what everything looked like. I wanted this to look like this. Why, Pastor? Because in my mind, <laughs> I could see that God would, would allow us at times to have people filling these altar, these steps up with people that were crying out to God for salvation, for restoration, for rededication, for a call, 
pouring their heart out, asking God to have something change in their lives. And we've seen it filled over and over and over and over again. Why? Because it's an area that we've set aside. Scripture, they call it consecrated, set aside for holy purposes. And isn't it interesting that people, <laughs> that people will get out on their hands and knees and put their face right into these steps where people have walked with their shoes? Why would people do that? Because they really don't care about all of that. All they want to do is get strictly, straightly, completely at God's feet and worship Him. And that's why it's there. That's what an altar is for. Um, <clears throat> I mean, let's see, where was I? <laughs> in, in Romans 12, 1, uh, Paul says, Therefore I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer or commit or sacrifice your bodies, sacrifice your bodies, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, it's your spiritual act of worship. Maybe, I thought about this. When I read, when I, when I was putting that down, I thought about a couple things, and here's the one thing that came to my mind. Maybe it's time that we do what God called Elijah to do in 1 Kings 18. I mean, it's Elijah by himself against all the prophets, the 400 prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of, of, uh, of, of uh, Asherah there, and, and, and you think about that's, what is that math? 850 prophets against one, against Elijah. But can I tell you the difference between those two? All those 850 prophets, did I get that number right? 850 prophets didn't have the power of God in their life. Somebody say amen. Elijah did, and when he called down fire from heaven, it called down upon that altar. It was a place, it was a place. Before anything else happened, Elijah went in and he reset that altar. He prayed through and on that altar, and God did a mighty work at that altar. Maybe this morning... <laughs> Maybe this morning you need to, to repair that broken altar in your life. Maybe this morning you need to recommit your heart to the Lord afresh. Maybe this morning you need to come to this altar. This speaks of dedication and dedicate your life again to Christ. Maybe you need to build an altar. The second thing that Isaac did was pitch the tent. <laughs> he pitched the tent. Verse 25, uh, chapter of Genesis chapter 26. Isaac put an altar there and called on the name of the Lord there Right there, he pitched his tent. Now, Isaac heard the, the, the Lord, uh, the voice of the Lord there in Beersheba. He had moved around all over, didn't know where God was, didn't find, couldn't find him, didn't know what was going on. He had a bad time in his life. Then he comes to Beersheba, and God puts a calling to him right there. He didn't run away from that calling. He pitched his tent there. Uh, he met with God. He pitched his tent there. He didn't, he didn't do like us and go right back to the same messed up way that we do life. It changed him, and he didn't run away from that calling. In fact, he just drove a stake, put a tent there, and said, here's where I'm going to be. I'm not going to run away from it. Here's where I'm going to be. Listen, the, the people of God should always want to stay close to the presence of God. If God is speaking, if God is calling, that's where we need to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 11, the Bible says it was he, God, it was he, some translations say, called. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, what? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What does all that mean? It means that you got a job to do. If you'll look on the announcement boards when we've had them up scrolling before the service, it says we need your help. You don't have to have you don't have to have a particular skill set. We'll uh, we will we will train you. Uh, not me because I don't know how either. But we'll train you how to do these things up there. We'll we got new people up there right now that's running some of our, our boards. We got other people up there that's been there for a long time can't run videos. But uh, was that bad? Was that bad? Terry, don't turn my sound off. Okay, these people want to hear the rest of this sermon. Please don't do that. <laughs> that was, oh, that was your fault. Okay. That was a good sermon I had going until that point, amen. We'll make sure you was listening. No, nah, we love Mark. He's, I couldn't do it without him. So anyway, I'll probably find out soon. Um, but can I tell you one thing? Just on a side note, Mark's pitched his tent too. He, he's been doing this ever since I've been here and does a marvelous job. So y'all give him a hand, okay? Is that better? <laughs> Mark fixed his tent. Maybe God has given you a call. 
and maybe you go, I, I remember, I remember Terry up there, um, uh, been me, I, I'll tell Terry, I, I was, I was needing a sound guy over at the other church there, and um, I couldn't find one. I didn't have anybody that had the ability, uh, the guy that was doing it had left to go do something else or moved or something, and I came up to Terry, who was a greeter at the church there, he was at the side door, but what I noticed about Terry was that he was there every Sunday, always had a smile on his face, always greeted people, he was there all the time, he was very available. I said, Terry, let me think, I want, to, I want you to think about running the sound system for me. He said, you nuts. I don't know how to turn that thing on, much less run it. I said, well, God will teach you how to do it if you'll be willing to do it. And, you know, it, there was very little hesitation on him. He says, well, okay, if you, you know, if you got some faith in me, then I'll be glad to do it. And Terry run the sound for me over there for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years. And he's running the sound for us over here, glory to God. Because it wasn't because he had the ability to do something. It was because he had the availability to do something, and he knew God would fill in the blank. So when God's calling you to do something, pitch a tent right there and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I just know I'm going to do it. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Let me ask you this. This is a side note here. I'm going to chase a rabbit for a minute, okay? I'm going to chase a rabbit for a minute. Would it be better for you to do something in your power in your knowledge, in your ability, or would it be better for you to do something in the power, in the intellect, in the knowledge of Christ? Have you thought about that? I mean, we do things so many times so wrong that it's, we have to untrain ourselves so that we can be retrained. Can it be better to come to God with a blank slate and have him teach you? And can I tell you this, folks? That's what's happening over our church. There's a little girl, they're not here today, they're on spring break somewhere, but little Kayla Henderson, shy little girl, she's, she's, she's teaching now in our women's uh, Thursday Bible study and having a great time. She said, first time I did it, scared me to death. I was sweating, I was so scared. And she said, the second Sunday, I wasn't nervous at all. It was just great. And she's doing great things because she had a blank slate and she said, God, if you'll help me through this, I'll do it, but I'm not going to do it on my strength, my power, my ability. I'm going to do it on yours. And you know what? God blessed that little girl. She did then, it says in verse 14, Ephesians chapter 4, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there over scheme, every wind, of, um, every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men, their deceitful scheming. Let's be close to God. Sometimes we're going to have to pin our, to, uh, pitch our tent next to God and stay there. We need to get out of our comfort zone, out of our own abilities, out of the things that we do well, and lean up next to God and say, what would you do? What would you have me do? How do I do it? That's when we're successful. No matter how hard we try, we cannot ultimately trust God and retain the things of this life at the same time. We can't do God's stuff and do the world's stuff at the same time. It just won't work. I mean, the Bible talks about that in Revelation. It's about us being lukewarm Christians and it making God want to spew you out of his mouth. Um, Remember, the altar speaks of dedication. The tent speaks of detachment. And thirdly, finally, he dug a well. Isaac dug a well. Um, Isaac built an altar there, called on the name of the Lord. He pitched his tent. Uh, there he pitched his tent. And there his servants dug a well. I think it's interesting here that the other two things it said that Isaac did by himself. This time it says there his servants dug a well. It is not enough for this pastor to dig deep in the Word of God. It's not enough for this pastor to follow God. It is not enough for me to do it all. This thing gets successful when we all dig a well, when we all get our shovel out, when we all say, I don't know what I can do, but whatever I can do, I'm there. I'm going to be available to God. Listen, this is so good. The well here speaks of dependence. Without water, our earthly bodies will die in the same way without living water, our spiritual lives will die. Psalms 1-3, the Bible describes a person who reads and meditates upon the Word of God. Psalms 1-3 says this, He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. What do you mean? It doesn't, it doesn't wither because there's water. And we need that living water in our life. For Isaac, it was a matter of life and death. It was a matter of digging or dying. He had to have water. And in that middle, middle Eastern landscape, we're about to go there. <clears throat> and we leave tomorrow for there. They, they, had, they had to have lots of water. 
So wherever they went, Isaac and his servants dug a well. Can I just tell you that when the group leaves this afternoon at 1.30 and they get to Tennessee and they begin working, they got to dig a well. When we go to Israel, when we go to Guatemala, we got people in Guatemala right now. It's not enough for us just to go. It's a, we've got to go and we've got to dig wells wherever we go. Um, Matthew 4, 4, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So for the child of, of God, for my life, for your life, folks, we got to dig. We, we either dig or we die. I don't know how many of you do this, but sometimes I get so busy in the busyness of life and all of that. What's the first thing that suffers whenever you get real busy? Somebody say quiet time. <laughs> And, I, and listen, I got them guilty. I'm just, I'm, I'm guilty. But when I don't have my alone time with God, when I don't have my water from God, my life gets dry. I don't think about it because I'm so busy. Some of you have heard this little story. Um, there was a, um, a logger. Back when they didn't have the big saws, all they had was axes. And so he, uh, this, one, this one lumberjack, he comes into this place where they're cutting the trees down. He says, I want a job. He says, okay, well, I'll give you a try for a couple of days. Yeah, you do. First day he goes out, and, man, he cuts down more trees than everybody else. I mean, they thought they had them a superstar right then and there. Second day, he did good, but he didn't do as good. Third day, he didn't do well at all. And finally, the fourth day, the uh, supervisor called him into the office there and said, dude, I'm going to have to let you go. He goes, well, I don't understand why, because I've been working hard. I've been working just, I worked longer. I worked harder than anybody else. He says, I just don't understand why that I'm not cutting as many trees. And the foreman said this to him, have you sharpened your ax? You know what he said? I didn't have time to sharpen my ax. Folks, I'm going to tell you what. It's not just availability. It's just not how hard you work. You got to have living water to keep your ax sharp. Does anybody like that? Does anybody know that's the truth? Isaac built an altar. Isaac pinched, pitched a tent. Isaac dug a well. Um, I'm going to ask you three questions. Then we're going to sing. We're going to have communion service. Are you looking for God? to make you successful in his calling to you. I, 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 have, I have lunches with, with somebody that, that needs to talk to me almost every day of the week, and we're always talking about, well, I, I know God's calling me to do something, but I just really don't know how to make my next step. I, I know that God would have me do this or have me do that, but I don't know what to do. My relationship with my husband, my wife, my spouse is not good. And I don't know what to do about it. I'm about to lose my job and I don't know what to do about it. Somebody in my family or I have something going on health-wise and I don't know what to do about it. Maybe you should build an altar. Maybe instead of running away from God, you should run toward Him. In your heart of hearts, have you decided to let go of the world and hitch your wagon to Jesus? Maybe you need to pitch a tent. And have you, have you had your quiet time today? Have you, did you have your quiet time yesterday? Have you filled up the watering hole in your life? with the living word from God. If you haven't done those three things, there's a really good possibility that you're not going to follow through with God's call in your life. You say, well, I'm working hard for God. Yeah, you are. But are you doing what God's calling you to do? This sermon is really not so much about evangelistic thoughts. It's really more for you mature Christians that are out there that should have your toes sore about right now because mine are, 
I built this sermon and finished it up last night. And I began to pray, asking God, have I, am, am, am I fervent enough in my prayer? Have, have I pushed away the world? Do I have enough of living water in me to be able to lead my people in the way that you'd want me to? So maybe some of you more mature Christians, maybe this is the day that you fall before God, put your face on that altar, like you did when you got saved, like you did when you got rededicated, like you did when somebody was sick in your, in your life or something was going on or a storm came into your life. Maybe today's the day you do that again and you find out that there's power in the name of Jesus. Let's stand together.